In this talk, I'll give a presentation of the impossibility result in reward function learning and my research agenda to get around this result and still learn what humans prefer. The no free lunch theorem for value learning is quite simple. We have the behavior of an agent or a human, and we'd wish to infer what their preferences are from that. Unfortunately, we can't. We cannot go directly from the behavior to the uh, preferences without making strong assumptions. Now, no free lunch theorems are not normally that relevant because one applies a simplicity prior or regularization and then they go away. However, here, simplicity priors don't help. In fact, they make it worse. The three simplest explanation of human behaviors are that humans are fully rational all the time, humans are fully anti-rational, or humans have flat zero preferences. And it doesn't matter too much what form of simplicity one uses. I tend to use Kolmogorov of complexity, but one can also use things like Kolmogorov of complexity plus program runtime and one gets sensibly the same result. How does this work? Well, I'm going to model an agent as a pair, P, a planner, and R, a reward function. What is a planner? Well, we're trying to model rationality, rationality, bias, or all ways of acting in the most general form possible. So what the planner is, is a map from reward functions to policies. For instance, the fully rational planner is one such map. Uh, satisficing is another such map, and so on. What we can observe from the behavior of the agent is only the policy pi, so the image of the planner. And we can observe this only in part. However, I'm going to assume for simplicity that we can observe the entirety of the policy, which means we observe not only behaviors, but counterfactual behaviors. If we're thinking about humans and we imagine looking inside the brain, looking inside the gray matter, this could give us a way of observing the full policy by estimating what the brain would do in exotic circumstances. Now, let us start with the pair that is the simplest pair compatible with pi. Um, the simplest planner reward function pair. Compatible with pi means that, well, p maps r onto this pi. So these are possible interpretations of the agent's policy. I'm going to do a simple operation here in most computer languages. I'm going to apply the planner to the reward function. This gives us the policy by definition. And then I'm going to construct three other pairs from this, also very simple operations. I have the greedy planner, which always takes the action that maximizes immediate reward. That's the PG. This goes along with a reward function defined by the policy. This reward function is one if the agent takes the action that the policy would, uh, would make it take, and zero otherwise. So obviously the greedy planner applied to this reward function would always choose the action that the policy would say. So this pair is also compatible with the policy. Double negating this with the anti-greedy planner and the negative of that reward function also gives us a compatible pair. Finally, there is the indifferent planner, p pi, which maps every reward function to that policy. Uh, add to that the zero reward function, and you have a compatible pair. Since note that the complexity of uh, these pairs are the complexity of the policy. So in the top two, the planners are very simple and the reward function is very complex. For the indifferent planner, the planner itself is very complex and the 
reward function is very similar. However, since these operations of applying one, um, applying the planner to the reward function to get the policy, and then either constructing the reward function from that policy or constructing the indifference planner are both simple operations. This shows that these three are, in most computer languages, very simple um, pairs. So they are floating around the bottom of complexity. Now, contrast that with the real pair. So a planner and a reward function, which are, well, what we're calling real, something that better encompasses our understanding of human values. This pair contains bias information, i.e. the difference in expectation between the optimal policy for this reward function and the actual human policy. These bias can be quite complex. Contrast that with the other three pairs. They don't have any bias information whatsoever. The greedy planner has no bias at all. Um, the anti-greedy planner is maximally biased at every uh, point. And the indifference planner has no concept of bias because it doesn't even look at the reward function and the reward function is zero anyway. What this means is that any realistic um, planner reward pair must contain more information than these three, uh, these three pairs do. Hence, in terms of complexity, it is of higher complexity because it contains more information than these three do. Now, I want to emphasize that these three planners, these three degenerate planners, I'm not particularly afraid that we'll stumble into them. You can rule them out with one bit of information. However, what this shows is that simplicity does not get us what we want. And if we start ruling out everything by hand, we don't know that what we have left there will be what we want. At this point, there may be an objection springing to mind. It certainly has sprung to my mind is that we know what humans want from observing them. So what is supposedly impossible is, for us, easy. And we can predict that behavior with that knowledge. So this isn't just internal certainty. This has demonstrable effects on the real world. For example, if we see someone getting very angry, get, um, no, not someone getting very angry, someone getting red in the face, shouting at us and throwing stuff at us, we can conclude that they are angry and wish to harm us. What we've got, done here is gone from behavior to preferences, something supposedly impossible. So what is going on here? Well, humans have a theory of mind, which I'm going to model here as an empathy module and a human predictor. These have co-evolved. Four, three humans, and a typical history HH for a human H. The empathy module applied to this history by both humans K and L are roughly the same thing. So the human's theory of mind are quite similar uh, from one human to another. What's also the case is that our own internal theory of mind, when we apply it to ourselves, is quite similar to other humans' theory of mind about us. Not identical, but very similar in terms of agents in possible mind space. Moreover, once we have the planner and reward function that comes from these um, empathy modules, if we apply the predictor to it, then it's a pretty good predictor. So given the empathy module and the predictor, the reward is simple to deduce and typically predictive. The limitations of this 
is that for it only applies in typical circumstances when we encounter very novel situations our theory of mind may start to break down and more importantly it's only given the theory of mind so if we don't have an ai that starts out with this theory of mind it will not deduce the same thing about the preferences of humans we use this theory of mind a lot in practice though it feels a bit like debugging and design rather and error correcting rather than using our theory of mind and injecting our preferences so when we decide to model something as or the, use the candidate functions for expressing human preferences and when we throw out obviously wrong results and change the hyperparameter until it works our criteria of it works all come from our empathy module and our prediction module and this is okay because the programmers are implicitly using their theory of mind which is somewhat shared in order to correct debug or refine uh, their programs or in practice inject their own values into the process which uh, which since human values and preferences are quite similar is is actually a pra in practice a fine thing to do now the limitations of this are that implicit to explicit is not easy in ai witness the failures of good old-fashioned ai and the expert systems so just because we can do it implicitly doesn't mean that we can do it explicitly easily the other thing is that our empathy modules are not fully shared uh, just a small example here they compared indians and americans and found that americans tended to assign responsibility for certain actions more to people's innate preferences whereas indians assigned it more to circumstances so empathy modules or theories of minds are not perfectly aligned are not perfectly the same so there is some limitation to using empathy modules to deduce the values of other agents the other problem is that this does not generalize very well reason being well the obvious is that if we assign implicitly if we tune our hyperparameters or tune our programs locally by our implicit module when we extrapolate this we're likely to encounter situations where our extrapolated values go quite wild in order to get around this and ground a definition of human preferences we need a good theory and the sketch of such a theory is what i'm going to present in the rest of this talk now taking daniel dennett uh, was famous for talking about the intentional stance if we look at say alpha go we can look at a physical stance this is a collection of atoms and electrons and put in certain configuration we could also look at it as a design stance this was designed to win at alpha go we could also look at it as the intentional stance in which alpha go intends to win so if we play alpha go then we intend we don't intend but we expect to lose notice the different stances are useful in different circumstances if i am moving alpha go from one place to another the physical stance is the most useful if i am playing them at go the intentional stance is the better way of modeling them now dennett's intentional stance was for the purpose of predicting the agent's behavior um though our use of it is to predict the agent's preferences but because this is a stance it is possible to have a super intelligent ai that could have all the world's video feeds all of wikipedia 
also show science research, perfect predictions of human behavior, be able to perfectly manipulate humans, so ideal at interacting and manipulating humans in every way, and it could still conclude that humans are fully rational. And it would not be wrong. It would not necessarily be right, but it would not be wrong. It is using a different theory of mind. So given that, how can we go about actually learning human values? Well, we can start with the human source code or our brain. And from that, we can look at human mental models, the models in which we rank different options like, ooh, that would be embarrassing, or ooh, I really want that, or I really, I would like to go that way, um, I would uh, not go that way. I think I prefer this option. These preferences exist within our mental models when we compare one option with another. Then extract these partial preferences, as I call them, as a series of this is better than that, this is better than that, in various background circumstances. Uh, some of these will be meta preferences, preferences about what we ourselves would want to prefer. Uh, like we might prefer to be more generous or more consistent or less hypocritical. To do this, we need some human symbol grounding. We need to understand what the symbols in our brain mean when translated into the world. Fortunately, this question seems to have empirical solutions. Then, the assumption that I am going to make, the thing that removes the no free lunch theorem by making the assumption is that these preferences are relevant. These A greater than B, this option greater than that, is preference relevant. These are, in a sense, the definition of what the pieces of our preferences are. The preferences within our mental models. Then, using a complicated alchemical process of merging and weighting all these partial preferences together, we can get an actual reward function or utility function that summarizes the preference of this one human. This can then be given to the AI in order that it can maximize that human's preferences of course, there is a AI symbol grounding issue um, there. What does behavior have to do with this? Well, there is a lot of uncertainty, potentially, about the human's internal brain states, about uh, various versions of symbol grounding, and this will translate into uncertainty about the ultimate reward function that the AI must maximize. Human behavior is then taken as evidence of the human source code of the human brain states and of the human symbol grounding. So in this way, once this theoretical construction is complete, the AI can look at human behavior and infer what we would prefer. Now, since it is good to at least start Formalization. Here is how I am imagining these things to go, starting with the source code, having the preferences as pre-orders, um, then using, um, using model theory to ground these, um, these human pre-orders into preferences over worlds, and then assuming that these are preference relevant and constructing the human utility function from this. Then another round of symbol uh, grounding for the AI and the AI now has a utility function defined in terms of its own world theories to maximize. These are in a sense the key parts of this research agenda, the mental models, 
human symbol grounding, the meta preferences and the synthesis process, the sigma that puts all these pre-orders together. The meta preferences are generally seen as preferences over different sigmas. The theory of mind, the empathy modules, the I know what H wants, in this view, it gives us privileged access to the pre-orders, to the mental models. When we say that we know what other people want, what we are getting is using our own theory of mind to access their internal models. This method, even if not carried out fully, can be used to improve other methods. For example, one method is stated preference, ask humans what they want, or revealed preferences, observe what humans do and conclude that that is what they genuinely want, or some form of idealized human thinker, like a mega philosopher in a box for a thousand years. All of these have flaws. There are many cases where stated preferences are wrong and where we know them to be wrong. Revealed preferences have a lot of problems with bounded rationality. Um, for example, I have not submitted a patent to cure various cancers yesterday, even though I probably could if I was unboundedly rational and looked through Wikipedia and quantum mechanics. So you can't conclude from that that I do not wish to cure cancer or do not wish to be rich. The problem is that in most toy examples of revealed preferences, the actual options that the humans have are very restricted and are not in a realistic set. An idealized human thinker has the problem of value drift. Now, in these cases, we can patch these things. We say, OK, yes, in politics or in the court, we don't expect people to necessarily be truthful in romance either. Reveal preferences. Yes, there is this problem. There's that problem. And then we can patch and patch. Problem with this, of course, is that we patch until we can no longer think of any patches to apply further. So we basically go as far as we can think and then give up. That is almost certainly still flaws that we have not discovered. Where the method I'm proposing could help is instead of just doing these patches, we can say that method M fails in situation S. So that's a patch. But we say that it is because the internal models of the human differ from what this method would predict. So once we have a reason for this patching and this failure, it seems a lot easier to get the AI to generalize from that. Finally, there are a bunch of other methods like corrigibility, the ability to modify the AI's goals safely, low impact, distillation amplification, and similar methods. They all require some portion of human preferences. They cannot be done in a value ag agnostic way, in a fully value agnostic way. However, as you can, I like to say, Gandhi, Hitler, Howe and Thanos all agree on what those terms mean. Like they would all agree on what a corrigible AI is or what a low impact AI is. So what this means is that we don't have to fully define a human utility function, just some pieces of it in order to apply it to these methods. Thank you for listening. For more details, look at uh, the Occam's Razor paper uh, on the archive and my research agenda on Less Wrong. Links to these will be provided in the YouTube commentary box.